Okay, so we're live. So this is Justin for our episode number one of the Andrew Meter Show. Today we have Alex Krupe and Nick Terry. Say hi, you guys. Hello. Hello, guys. How are you guys doing today? Good, good, good day. Very productive day for once. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Awesome. So today we're going to just kind of catch up on what's been in the news for the last couple of months since CES, try to catch up on everything, start off the show correct. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is the S5. Um, what do you guys think of it? I know a lot of people had issues with the backing, even though as um, I... Okay, put, so we're live. So this is Justin... So what do you guys think of the backing, the specs, everything else that is on there that people thought it would be a higher quality device or different? Um, personally, I think that a lot of people were expecting um, more of like an iPhone type of device only in its design where it would have a more polished sort of body. Um, I think that they ended up going for something that was a lot more focused on um, sort of the artistic aspect, I guess, or girls liking it. Um, and the, the biggest thing is that the specs that it ended up having, it seems a lot like an iPhone 5, 5S conversion, where it's minor specs that are inside that changed when a lot of the stuff on the outside, nothing really popped out that made me want to get it. But normally with like the 5, 5S type of deal, there's those two years. And then there's going to be like the 6 or whatever, and then there will be some major hardware change. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the 3 and the 4 were supposed to be those clones of each other almost with slight hardware differences mm -hmm. and internals. But I was expecting the 5 to have a revolutionary new look. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as well. I didn't really consider the whole um, three to four situation, but uh, honestly, there, there's nothing right now that's really um, getting me excited enough to go out and buy one, even if I did get it on contract. What do you think, Nick? Um, I, I like the specs of the phone, but like everybody says, I don't like the fact that they still went with cheap plastic and... I do not like the back of the phone at all. It looks like a girl's phone, just like he said. But like I said, this I like the specs. I do like the specs. Um, I honestly thought that this thing was going to be curved. Just I thought that's the way Samsung was going to go, especially... Kind of like how the note curve is, or kind of like how the flex is? I'm talking about like the flex. Why, why did you think it was going to be that? I don't. I don't really know it. Samsung's always going for that revolution, that revolutionary um, type of deal with their new phones, and they come out with the new Galaxy phones. And I thought that'd be a really good way for them to say that that phone was revolutionary is come out and have a even bigger curve than the Flex did. See, I had the Flex, and I just never found a benefit to it. I never found that curve to be appealing. It was cool at first, but after the first five minutes with it, it just was a gigantic screen that I carried around with me. That's why I, I was I, I was kind of glad not to see any flex search curve screen on it or any of the new flagship devices because unless they have a real use for it, I just don't see why it needs it. Yeah, the, the whole flexing thing seemed a lot more like a novelty. It, it made sense where they were going with the research and saying that it could give more depth to the screen, but after actually using it, especially because they only had 720 on the flex, it, it really didn't... It's not useful enough at this point. So, do you think people... Going back to the S5, now that we kind of left that, do you think people are going to upgrade their 3s from it, or do you think people will actually make the jump early from their 4s? Do you think it's enough for the general public? I think it's more than enough for people to jump from a 3, like, easily. Um, personally, I would have jumped from the 3 to the 4 if I had had the 3. Um, there was a big enough difference just in those two. But for someone who, like myself, who owns a 4 right now, 
again, there's not really much for me to say I really need this device. I mean, unless my front camera gets even worse and I just can't even take selfies with it, I'm not going to buy a new phone anytime soon. Yeah, it's just, I, I don't like how, I understand how fitness and health is a big, like, thing right now. But I don't understand why companies like Samsung are putting so much effort into it. Like, they have the heart rate monitor. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that the one, the, the S5 is the one with the heart rate monitor, right? Yeah. It's just That just seems so gimmicky. It's ridiculous. It's like, but then again, it's how I originally felt about the fingerprint scanner on the 5, or iPhone 5. And... Or 5S, excuse me. And it, though it did seem really gimmicky, it's actually pretty cool once you use the device. But, See, but uh, again, I don't even use a lock on my phone, so that's another thing that's just gimmicky. I'd never use either of those things. See, I understand the password or the fingerprint because it, like, locks your phone, but it's like you have to be working out or you have some random want to check your heart rate. <laughs> that feature. Well, let me double check my heart rate right now. I've been texting quite a bit. <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to throw something in on that. Uh, Droid Life wrote a post when that was all going on, and any smartphone with the flash on the back of it with an LED is able to do that heart rate monitor thing that Samsung says their S5 mm -hmm. can do. Yep. So it's nothing new, and they're bringing it out and calling it revolutionary. It's some. It's just a cheap gimmicky thing that they're throwing on the back that it's going to appeal to fitness nuts. Well, no. and I think they're also, we're at the point right now where technology has grown so quickly and trying to come out with a phone every single year that, like, I can't think of something else I would want in a phone. Like, other than having integrated, um, like, wireless charging on the S4, which the S5 doesn't even have, other than having that, I can't think of something else I would want on a device other than more battery life because... Right now, it seems a lot like um, when the first iPad came out, and it was it was just useless. Like a lot of people, especially in the tech world, were like, "Okay, cool, tablet," but they were holding back so much because they had no idea what they were going to do for the second one. The second one they came out ended up being what the first one should have been the entire time. That's true. So, next, the next major uh, flagship device that's been announced already this year is the HTC One M8. Um, I thought it got a nice hardware change or modification, I guess. That's a little more curved. What do you guys think about that? How, what do you think of the dual back cameras and stuff? Um, I. Th I like the I like what they did with the depth sensing camera they added onto it. I do not like that they stuck with that same four ultra pixel camera. Um, also, they took out the optical image stabilization, which is a a huge don't do nowadays. You can't do that. Um, there was reason they took it out, but still, I mean, that they have a really low resolution camera, and it doesn't even have any optical image stabilization. I really don't like that they did that. So my question is, is I understand the idea of ultra pixels and how it makes them bigger and everything, but why can't they just add a couple more on there so that it helps the photos out a little bit? Maybe I just don't understand the technology enough to, like, why can't they upgrade that to at least, like, six or eight or something over last year's? Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's some technical reason that it's just above our heads. I don't know. Well, the, the technology that goes into the ultra pixels isn't really, like, the most revolutionary thing. It, the issue with having more is that I don't think they felt they needed more. Even when they came out the first one, they even said, it doesn't need more. Four of our ultra pixels are better than any camera on the market, so why would we put more into it? Like, that's what they said when the first one came out, so obviously their opinion really hasn't changed much. Yeah, uh, just... Uh, uh, it makes me wonder why, even with all the critics of last year's model, they just wouldn't upgrade it. Like, it's the exact same camera. <laughs> no difference, besides the little um, depth sensor. But besides that, there's nothing really new in it besides the upgraded processor, right? And the 5 megapixel selfie camera? Not to my knowledge. It's got Sense 6 on it. It's a lot better than 5.5. <laughs> I, I do like how it's a little bit cleaner, not so bugged down. 
Like I, I know you owned the one uh, HC One M7, but I only tried it a couple times, and I just found it confusing, and I got lost in it so many times. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any custom skin that these carriers or phone manufacturers throw over the and over Android are good. But if I had to use any, I would use Sense. See, between Samsung's TouchWiz and Sense, I would choose Sense, but I still say LG's is the cleanest skin than there is out there. Well, that one was one of my favorites that I've used simply because of how, like, close, I guess, it was, and it didn't have as much bloatware. And the key, the whole um, remote control thing, that was awesome. Yeah, the remote control app is a lot better than anything I've used. But I was looking at some of the coverage of the remote in the new HTC One, and it looks like it's works really well. It integrates with your TV listing, mm -hmm. so you can like search for TV shows that are on right now. Tell I, I want to watch this show, and it will automatically tell your or IR blast your TV to go to the channel. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. So out of those two flagship devices, since we haven't seen a um, real big flagship from LG, what would you guys choose? Because they're exact same specs internally, 2 gigs of RAM, Snapdragon 801 processor, just cameras are different and software is different. What would you guys choose? I would honestly, I would take the S5. Why? It comes down to the camera. That it has a 13 megapixel camera as opposed to a 4 megapixel camera. I mean, that's a big decider when it comes to me buying a phone. And Samsung's is going to blow HTC's out of the water. Okay. So, what about you, Krupi? Honestly, I think I'd end up going with the S5 for the same reason I went with the S4 over the um, HTC One. Like, though it didn't change much. Neither did the HTC One or the all new HTC One, <laughs> and it, the minimal changes in both still show that the S5 is probably going to be a better phone in general, simply because it's still going to have the same up in specs that the S4 did, or excuse me, yeah, that the S4 did over the One, though they are minimal. Okay, so. Um... Nothing really else happens in the phone world besides that. I mean, there's the Oppo Find 7, which is coming out with two different variants. Um, it's it's neat that it's coming out with the HD 1080p version and a 2K version. But I just wonder, is there a need at this moment? Like, I know people ask the same thing when 1080p screens came out, but w would you guys benefit at this point with a 2K screen? Honestly, for the size, no, I don't think so. The The awesome thing about 4K is how big a screen can get and still have good quality. To have, like, even a 5-inch screen with a 2K is just seems unnecessary to me. Mm -hmm. What's your what, with a 2K screen on a smartphone, I mean, wouldn't you think that's going to drain the battery life and make that phone get really hot? Well, that's the same I don't know about the heat, about but the battery life is going to be atrocious. Yeah. Unless their battery is like 4,100 million. I think it's 3,000. Still, that that's from, what is the S4? Like 20, here, I can look. It's like S4 is 20, 20, 20, I think it's 26, I'm not sure. What does it say? <laughs> I think it's like 26 or 28, and still, though my battery life's good, I usually use it in power save mode and I don't have the screen brightness at full which a 2k screen needs a better screen brightness because when you have a lower screen brightness with that high resolution you won't be able to see the detail in the pixels and then it's just completely useless that's true that's why when you turn up the brightness on a phone it looks better very true would you guys ever even think about going and buying a phone that's mainly made for foreign countries, like they haven't broken into the U.S. Um, phone world yet. I think about the only phone I do that with right now would be the Meets You. Just, just that that phone just felt so good when we had it. I think that's about the only phone though that 
I would say, all right, foreign market, but it doesn't matter because this phone's amazing. What about you, Nick? Would you stick more with, like, an unlocked Nexus or something you can buy off your carrier, or would you actually spend five, $600 to get a phone that might have higher specs than anything we can get here but isn't as stable or as known? I would definitely go with something like an unlocked Nexus from here. So, I mean, I don't want something that's not stable. At this point, I'm done with phones like that. Well, yeah. and the other issue is also that, like, the necessity for more power is very limited. Like, I know I don't play many games on my phone, but honestly, like, what are you doing on your phone that you need that much computer power? Well, I, something I can... I don't need an octa-core phone. That's not <laughs> really my business. I, I, I can see, like, Ubuntu was trying something for a while. It didn't really take off, but they were making it so that your phone was your computer. It showed Android when you were out mobile or whatever. And then you stuck it on a dock that connected to a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse, and all of a sudden it showed full Ubuntu on your screen. That and I guess, And that's something that's easy to do with something like Peppermint. You could do that now. Yeah. Because Peppermint's such a light version of Linux that it, that's not even an issue with most phones right now. But I'm saying if you take that idea mm -hmm. and put that on every phone. Can you imagine take, going, taking any phone you want and that being your computer? While you're out, it's your phone. You put it down, it's your, t your, it's your computer. It's kind of like the, what um, Asus was trying to do with the pad phone, or is trying to do with the pad phone, where you slide that in the back of a tablet and now that's your phone powering your tablet. Mm -hmm. But being able to take that functionality with any phone... And I, I like we were saying earlier, we need some, we need something to do with our phones. Right now, it's kind of stagnant. Like, where do we innovate from here? Mm -hmm. Something like that would give you use for making your battery bigger, making your processor bigger, more cores, more powerful, mm -hmm. into something. Well, and that that's one thing. I my biggest thing is always battery power, and that that's just me saying that. You're going to keep making phones faster and faster when that's not really as much of a necessity as somebody wanting to be able to use their phone all day as a heavy user. What do you think, Nick? I think with the type of batteries that we have now, I mean, it's just bat It's not. We're not going to get to that point where we want to get with smartphones with the batteries we have now. Someone's got to come up with a different, a completely different type of battery. The batteries we have now are just not going to do what we want them to do. All we can do is keep making them bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's not what we want to do here. Well, and that's what I think right now the biggest development in batteries or focus would be graphene. But just because graphene processors make it so much, like, processes so much faster and takes so much less power, that if you could implement that in a battery to store charge, but, I mean, there's people working on that already. <laughs> Okay, so next we're going to talk about glass. Even though Krupy's not wearing his, he is also I'm a... i a computer. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he's not wearing it, he's also a glass explorer, and we have two other explorers on the team that couldn't make it tonight. But um, one of the biggest discussion with glass is when are we going to see a release date and where does it grow from here? I know they, the last update we got was in December, and then in February they promised that the reason why they haven't been sending us out any new updates is that they're actually bringing KitKat, the uh, operating system, they're pumping it up to KitKat so that we will have hopefully ba better battery life, better stability, better um, everything. Do you th When do you think that will take, how long that will take? My, my biggest thing is Though porting an operating system isn't an easy task, that's something that they should have been working on. They were having very consistent monthly releases of updates, and then they completely just fell off. And the issue with that is that it, it peeved a lot of explorers to say that there's no reason for us to be waiting three months for an update with functionality that you should have been working on the whole time. My biggest complaint with Glass has always been the speech-to-text issue. And somebody asked me recently, is Glass worth it? 
And at this point, I would not suggest anyone spend the money to be an explorer if they have the opportunity. Because we're probably close to a release date at some point. As well as right now, without with the limited um, speech to text capability, it's not the device I want it to be. It's not a device that I'm not trying to get it to replace my phone, but its use and functionality is based off me being able to tell it what to do. And if I lose internet connection or something, it's just a big piece of like glass hardware on my face. And and I mean, for you, you it's still glasses, but for me, it just sits there and does absolutely nothing. It can basically just be dead and it would be exactly the same. So Nick, as someone that doesn't have glass, what is one of the biggest things you would want it to be able to do? Like what functionality, and if you know what bugs are there, because you, you know all about this technology as we complain about the different issues, what big issues would you want fixed? I don't even know any issues that it has. I don't use it, but um, I have the money set aside to go buy it. I'm waiting to buy it. It's it's just I don't see what value it has to me that my phone doesn't. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I don't. Mm -hmm. Well, and the biggest thing every time somebody like stops me and asks me about it, they're like, um, now the questions. Now that people actually know what it is, more often than not. The questions have turned from, ooh, what is that on your face, and are you recording me, to why did you buy it? What is the functionality? What reason did you buy this device over just having your phone? And it's not really that it replaces my phone, but with being as busy as I am, it keeps me like on top of things, and it keeps me more well-organized. And the best part of that is I can look up, see a text or an email or anything else that's an update that I asked for, and then if I don't want it, I can just not pull out my phone. I don't have to worry about it. And if it's something that's important, I can take a look at it and actually take my time to consider responding to it or whatever. And the biggest thing is being able to do that from class, which is the main purpose that I like, spent the money on it. And right now, that's just not always an option. Because the um, needed yeah. connection? Yeah. yeah. Well, and which isn't even an internet connection thing. I'll have internet, full Bluetooth connectivity, and can't reach Google. I think it times itself out if it just has a delay or something of reaching mm -hmm. the server. Yeah, and I mean, that didn't really happen as much before. What update was it? The December update? Yeah. And it's just like, what line of code got screwed up to make this happen, and why is it taking three months to fix it? The least you could do while we're waiting for KitKat is fix one line. Or a couple lines. Very right, sure. So with the announcement of Android Wear and the now move to wearables on Google's behalf, do you think that they'll bring any of that like functionality to Glass? Do you think we're going to see a different type of user experience where it's a little more a flowy graphic like they are showing on the watches, or do you think... I, I think they'd be silly not to, honestly. Um, maybe not as, like, flowy graphics like you're talking about, but they'd be silly not to embrace the abilities that Android Wear is giving them. And, I mean, it, it's your own software. Like, it's your own company working on this as well, and if those two teams, like, teamed up, it would make Glass a lot better just for user functionality. There's still things that, like sideloading things, that you have to be computer literate to know how to do. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I always notice is, and this is something like, it's been rumored that Google would be making a smartwatch and that when they were making the smartwatch, it wasn't the Glass X or the Google X team that made Glass mm -hmm. that would be working on the smartwatch. It was the Android team would be working on it. My question is, is like, these are two wearables from one company. Why wouldn't you work together in some way so you can integrate them, so you can make them more? Well, what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking on that would simply be that even if they were working together, it might be better for them not to because they're such different worlds. Like, in the end, you can take whoever did it better and integrate it with the other. But for the most part, it's something where Glass 
in my opinion right now, is not going to be the end-all future wearables. A watch is so much more inconspicuous. You can do more on it because it's not like up in your face and everybody asking you about it and stuff. And even once glass comes commonplace or anything like that, it's different from how we use things. And actually, that's something I was about to touch on, one of the questions we just got. Um, would you use Android Wear and Google Glass at the same time? If so, why? Um, I know Nathan uses Pebble at the same time as he's wearing his glass. So does and, Yeah, and the thing is that Android Wear has a lot more functionality than Pebble, I think, um, though currently I'm still waiting for my Pebble Steel, and I really do plan intend on wearing both. Um, but... I think Android Wear and Glass at the same time would be very redundant. Glass and your phone at the same time is already has a particular redundancy. And Android Wear, there's not much that Glass can do that the watch can't, I think, at this point, other than take pictures. So I'd probably still have Glass on because I already own it, but I don't think I'd buy both at the same time. See, my thoughts is that you, you would still be able to integrate them. And or like use them together. Mm -hmm. While you can answer text messages and stuff from the watch, it'd be cool to see. Oh, someone's calling me. Let me answer it on my glass, even though you can still mm -hmm. see that on your glass. So that's well, and that that is one thing that would be really nice is to that's a good point to take Android Wear and integrate the functionality from that to replace the touch panel on glass. So you don't have to be reaching up and looking into the sky. You can literally say, Oh, I'm getting a call answer, and then it's inside your skull, because glass has bone convention. <laughs> yeah, because I, I know playing with the SDK and everything, you you can launch activity activities on your phone from the watch. Like, if you pull up, you get a tweet, you want to look at it, it'll automatically launch it on your phone. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool if you can somehow launch something else on your glass. And so you don't have to sit there, scroll yeah. through a menu try to find your fitness app when you can just be, okay, Google or whatever on your watch and open this, and it's yeah. right there. That would be one thing that would be really cool if, it, if they, like, teamed up to make one integrated system. Okay, so one of the last things is we're going to talk about is Google I.O. is coming up. They finally announced the dates. We'll be able to, or people will be able to get register they put their name in line uh, starting August 8th through the 10th, and this year they're doing it differently than other years. They are making it random. What do you guys think about that? I'm like, any person can register. Any person can say, I want to go, put over their credit card, and that you don't have to check anything. Like, what do you guys, do you think there's going to be more developers there or more just people wanting the free swag? It's it's going to be more people there just going to get the new free stuff. And because what a lot of people do is they'll go there, they'll get this new phone that comes out, and they'll throw it up on eBay for three times what it's going to cost retail. And that's where you're going to see a ton of those people there. And I, I don't think that they should be doing this the way that they're doing it, randomly choosing people. Well, there's also the aspect that Google's mission for a while has been to try to get more people into the world of technology. And though like people like us are constantly say we have enough people, relax so that we have like so many job opportunities, but getting more people interested in it is really important. And one way to do that is to bring them to events like this so that if it is open for everyone to go to, you can be, what is it, I think 14 to sign up, or 16 to sign up, and once you go to the event, you might go to something like CES, so that it's making this one thing can make a larger impact for other companies, for people to try to say, all right, I want to get involved in technology so that I could go to more things like this. Though, there will still be a bunch of people there just for the free stuff. Yeah. I well... One thing that I was frustrated about when I finally, when they finally did say, all you have to do is put your name down, and we'll random select five thousand people, is that when they first announced back in February, hey, developers, heads up, we're gonna let you know next month that what exactly you have to do, and there was a line that you have to be approved. 
I, I know now that approved means like your credit card has to be approved. Mm -hmm. But I was hoping they were going to check that you had some kind of like app development skill, either something published on the Play Store. Like it, it's super easy to add some some little APK on there, but it, it's enough of a step that Joe Blow isn't going to just go sign up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one thing where obviously once you open it up like this, you're going to have more people who aren't developers come in because of how it's randomly selected. The thing is with that, that again, like I was saying, it, it can benefit Google in the fact that if a developer doesn't go, they're still going to watch everything that was at Google I.O. online. Yeah. So developers get the same information. Google still gets their information out to their dedicated audience that is doing everything they can to go, and they made the hard decision to say, we want to integrate more people to bring them here. It, it could just be sort of an advertisement stunt so that more people sign up and things like that, and then they can show sponsors, this is all the people that want to go to our event, etc. But the biggest thing is that it frustrates people who work so hard and can easily say, this is who I am, I want to have entry. And press has that, uh, kind of has that priority, but it's still in the way that a developer can't just say, I've been working on all these things. These are the amazing apps that I've made. Please let me come to your conference so that I can test out these devices and like meet some of you. You know. Yeah. So besides that, that looks like it's about it for us tonight. Um, well, let everyone know that we will start doing these weekly starting on Tuesdays, and they should all start around 5 p.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time. Sorry for the delay uh, today. But besides that, I think that's it for episode one of our show. Um, so this has been a great conversation with you guys. So I'll probably see you guys on Tuesday, hopefully, and see you guys later. It's a great sign-off, Justin. <laughs> I know. <laughs>